Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Hope that you are ready to worship with us. Hope that you've had a good week and are looking forward to the things that God is going to do in your home, in your church home this morning. Again, we're so glad to be with you. Let us know that you're here uh, by reacting when you uh, hear something Pastor Travis says or a song comes on that you identify with. We want to know that you're here worshiping with us. It brings us great encouragement to know that you and your family are joining us each Sunday morning uh, to worship together as Blanchard First. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Jason, and we're going to worship together. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what the Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. God, you do great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. God, you do great things. You will do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. God, above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things, oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh, God, you have done great things. In your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. God, you do great things. Oh, God, you do great things.
This next song we're going to sing is called Always. And it talks about how when we find trouble around us, that our hope is in Christ and that he's there for us. And so today as we sing this song, let's remember that. My foes are many. They rise against me. But I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. Oh my God, He will not delay, my refuge and strength always. I will not fear, His promise is true, my God will come through always, always. Yes. 
trouble surrounds me, chaos abounding, but I will trust in you. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. God, He will not delay my refuge and strength always. I will not fear, His promise is true. My God will come through always, always. from the Lord I lift my eyes up my help comes from the Lord I lift my eyes up my help comes from Father, we come to you today, Lord, and we are thankful, Lord, that you are always with us, Lord, that you watch over us in the trials and in the struggles. God, as we worship today, Lord, through giving, through praising your name, through hearing your word and going out into this world, Lord, we worship you in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, I'm going to turn it over to Josh now. He's going to come talk to you guys. Thank you, Jason, for that reminder. God is faithful, and sometimes, even whenever it seems like we're waiting, uh, he is faithful, and we need to remain faithful as well. And we, as a church, uh, this is a a time in the service where we would normally... uh, ask those who faithfully give to continue to do so. Just because we're not meeting in the building doesn't mean that ministry stops. And so uh, we are still continuing on. We're ramping up for camp. We're doing a lot of planning and doing some things around the office uh, and ministry continues. So we ask that uh, if you're faithful to give, you would continue to do that. There are three ways that you can do that. Uh, Number one, you can mail that into P.O. Box 370, Blanchard, Oklahoma, 73010. Uh, Then also you can get online, blanchardfirst.com, and click on the giving tab. And then we introduced this new uh, method of giving last week. And I just want to remind you as well, Jason's going to flash this number up, 844-611-2846. You text that number, and in the body of the message, just write any amount. Now, if it's your first time to do that, it'll uh, send you a secure link that you follow. You set up an account, and you can give that way as well. Uh, at church, we just want to we just want to encourage you. Uh, ministry doesn't stop. Ministry doesn't stop. And so, thank you for being faithful to give. And uh, let's pray one more time, and then Pastor Travis is going to come up, and we're going to continue on during our time of worship. God, we are so thankful uh, that you've called us to this time for this purpose. 
And God, we want to serve you. We ask that you would meet with each and every one of us, uh, wherever it is that we are worshiping this morning. God, meet with us. As we gather together as your people, uh, we know that you'll be there as well. We love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Well, listen, this morning we are uh, continuing on in our series, and I'm glad, uh, our series of First Peter, and I'm glad that you are here again this morning to join us. Um, and so if you would, I'm going to ask, at this moment, take your Bibles, uh, your app, uh, on your phone, your, your devices, whatever it may be, and I want you to turn to First Peter chapter 1, and this morning we are going to be looking at verses 6 through 9. So First Peter chapter 1. Verses six through nine. And of course, the, uh, the the title of this series is Sojourners. We introduced this series uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think this is the third Sunday we've been in this. And this idea of sojourners, the word simply means to uh, to be set apart, to be different. It's this idea that this world is not our home as born again believers. And Peter begins to reveal that to us and begins to lay that out. Not just for us, but he laid that out in this day and time. Uh, 62, 63, 64 A.D. uh, when he was talking to the uh, born-again believers who uh, he refers to as the elect exiles who had been dispersed uh, throughout uh, uh, the, the ancient Asia Minor area based upon the persecution that they were experiencing as born again believers. Listen, uh, one of the things, and, and, and with this idea of persecution, uh, one of the things that I have been asked time and time again in my years of ministry um, is this question of why is it that Christians have to suffer? You know, why is it that, that Christians have to experience uh, uh, bad things in their life? Why is it that they have to, to, to face storms in their life? Uh, and, and usually when the individual asks me this question, the reason they're asking this question is because somewhere along the way, um, they have heard this false teaching uh, that came out years ago, this idea that when one enters into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, that from that moment on, they will never suffer again here upon this earth. And, and, and church, I want you to know uh, that that is a complete lie. That is a false teaching. And uh, we're going to see this morning that, that, that Peter blows that false teaching out of the water. And uh, what Peter wants us to understand, and, and we looked at this last week, he talked about this idea of rejoicing, and this rejoicing is based upon what it is that Christ has done in our life. It is based upon this living hope that we have based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and, and so, yes, he says we can rejoice, but this morning, as we look at verses 6 through 9, Peter's going to remind us that joy is mingled with grief for those of us who are believers. Um, and, and so as we get into this, let me just kind of set the stage here, and I want us to kind of remember some things. I, I mentioned a while ago uh, that Peter is writing to a group of what he referred to as elect exiles, aliens, maybe your scripture says, and we're referring to them as sojourners, but elect exiles, they were uh, chosen by God to be his people, and God had dispersed them based upon the persecution that was taking place, and why was it that they were being persecuted? I shared this a few weeks ago, but Nero was the Roman emperor at this time. Uh, When Peter is writing this letter, and as Peter's writing this letter, uh, you remember the story, and you can go back and check your history books in this, uh, but Nero, or, or actually the city of Rome, uh, uh, burned. And about two-thirds of the city of Rome burned during this time when Nero was emperor. And uh, legend says, story has it, however you want to look at it, some say that happened, some say it didn't. They, they all agree that the fire happened, but some say that what I'm fixing to share with you may or may not have happened. But they said that while the city burned, there is this idea, this thought, this, this uh, 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 you know, story that has been passed down that as it burned, Nero played a fiddle uh, and, and, and sang a, uh, and, and was high, excited about the city burning down. Now, whether that happened or not, uh, there's some debate in that. But what did happen is that after the city was burned, Nero began to blame the Christians for the burning of the city of Rome. And what began to happen is that these Christians began to be persecuted. And so I find it interesting as you look at this. Yes, he spent verses 3 through 6 talking about this idea of why it is that we can rejoice based upon this living hope that we have, based in this living hope is based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but he also wants them to understand that even as a born-again believer, you are going to suffer trials. You're going to face trials. You're going to find yourself in the midst of storms. And church, here we are almost 2,000 years later, and the same thing is still true today. 
that as born-again believers, we will face trials in this life. And so this morning as we get into this, here's uh, uh, what we're going to see is that this series or this sermon today is titled, Tested by Fire. And what we're going to see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6-9 through 9, is that Peter begins to deal with this idea of trials and tribulations and suffering and troubles. And here's what he says, church. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor for the revelation of Jesus Christ, or at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful uh, for this time we have to come together this morning. Grateful that we've had that opportunity to worship you through song. And pray, Lord, now that as we enter into this time of studying your word, that, Lord, your word will be presented with clarity and with boldness, and I pray, Lord, that our ears will be open to the very truth you're going to reveal to us this morning. And Lord, I pray and ask that this morning you hide me behind the cross, because Lord, what I want more than anything is for you to be glorified, and for you to be honored, for you to be seen, and for you to be heard. Lord, we just love you, we thank you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so Peter talks about these trials. And let me just tell you what the word trial means. Trial here, uh, your Bible may say trouble, it may say tribulation, but either way, what it is, is it's a painful experience that you and I go through in in, in our life. And, And understand these painful experiences that we go through as Christians If given the choice, let's just be honest, if given the choice, uh, uh, we would always try to avoid these trials, these storms that we find ourselves in. But what Peter is telling you and me this morning, what he was telling them then and what he's saying to us this morning is we must understand that as Christians, joy is going to be mingled with grief. That we will face trials. And so because we are going to face trials in this life, we need to know how to respond. We need to understand why we go through these trials. And so what we're going to do this morning, church, and not really what we're going to do, what Peter's going to reveal to us through uh, the very words that God pressed upon his heart, what God is going to reveal to us is four principles about these trials that you and I will face. So point number one is this, and it's the very first thing that Peter wants you and I to understand, that as believers we need to understand that you will face trials in this life. In fact, you will face various trials in this life. Now, as we get into this, let's let's just kind of break verse 6 down a little bit. And and, and so let's go back and just read verse 6, and it says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Now, I love this this phrase, various trials, because of what it means. When you look at this, this phrase, various trials, what it means is variegated colors all right so so think of it this way uh, I, I don't know if you all have ever seen like stained glass windows I'm sure most of us have but if you look at a stained glass window window it is made up of, of different sizes of stained glass each stained glass is a different color I, I, I'll just uh, uh, explain it this way you know uh, uh, my father-in-law uh, uh, Aaron's dad he uh, likes to mess with uh, uh, colored glass. And, uh, uh, and, and one of the things he likes to do is to make things for his children. And I get to be uh, uh, the recipient of that and get to be blessed with that as well. And uh, my father-in-law, uh, I refer to him as Doc. And, and so Doc has made a lot of things that we have hanging up in our homes, uh, all of his kids, and, and, and we get to look at it quite a bit. But one of the favorite things that my father-in-law made out of colored glass or stained glass, I keep calling it colored glass, but stained glass is a nativity scene. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Uh, prior to our, my father-in-law giving uh, this nativity scene to all of his kids one Christmas, uh, uh, prior to that, one night or one day while I was there, there in Tahlequah house, I remember going down into the basement. Uh, my father-in-law had a workroom that was off of the, the basement that he would do his stained glass work as well as a lot of his woodwork. And I remember going in one day and I remember seeing all this stained glass, all these different sizes, all these different pieces, all these different colored stained glasses. And, and, and 
it's sitting on a table. And then I remember seeing off in the corner this diagram of what it is that he was making. And I'm just going to be honest with you. When I looked at the diagram and I looked at the table, church, it was this reality for me, this idea that there's no way that, that what's on this table is going to look like that because it was just rather confusing. But my father-in-law, being a man that has worked with stained glass a lot, began to put these pieces, these different pieces, these different sizes, these different colored stained glasses together. And what he began to create was a nativity scene that consists of uh, 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 the wise men, that consists of Mary and, and, and Joseph. It consists of the major, the barn, all the animals. And all of these things are, are, are made uh, from different, like I said, different sizes of glass, different colored And here's the thing, that which looked confusing to me in the beginning, my father-in-law created something beautiful and something that has become very valuable to me and my family, something that we get to enjoy every single day. Now, why do I share that with you? Again, I want to go back to this idea of various trials. It means variegated colors. And what Peter is saying to you and me, as we think of it in the terms of stained glass, what Peter is saying to you and me is we must understand that we're going to face various trials in this life. And these trials that you and I are going to face as born-again believers are going to come in different shapes and different sizes. And sometimes it may be a different colored stained glass, whatever it may be. And, and in the beginning, as you go through it, you're going to sit there and be confused. And you're going to ask, why am I having to go through this? And sometimes, church, it's not until later on down the road that we are able to look back And what we begin to see is that God has taken these various trials, these variegated colors, these different pieces, these trials that were come in different shapes and sizes, and begins to bring them together, and he begins to create something beautiful and valuable in your life and my life. Now notice what he says here. He says we're going to have various trials. But he goes on to say, and you back up a little, he says these various trials, if necessary. And again, I think it's interesting, and I I brought this up last week, but what this indicates, church, is that these trials that you and I go through as born-again believers, I want you to hear this. Many times they are God's will for our life. God allows you and I as born-again believers to go through various trials, and it is his will for our life. And I know that may be hard to kind of swallow, it may be hard for us to understand, but when I, I uh, see this if necessary and understand what it's trying to say, I can't help but think of Job. Job was a man who, who God allowed some things, some trials for him to go through, but God had a reason for it. Man, this past week, uh, reading through the book of Acts, finishing up at the end in Acts chapter 27 and 28, man, Paul had to go through various trials, a massive storm on a ship, and, 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 and this idea that, that uh, you know, God had promised him to get, that he was going to get him to Rome, but as they're on the ship, the storm comes up, uh, uh, they become, in a sense, stranded. Uh, uh, the, those, the sailors on the boat at one time was going to kill all the prisoners, but then God stopped that. And then another time they were going to get in a boat and leave the prisoners on the boat and let them go down with the ship. But God stopped that. And nonetheless, as Paul was going through all these various trials, what you begin to see is that God was doing something beautiful and, and creating something valuable in the sense that eventually Paul makes it to this little island. And, and, and you know what Paul begins to be able to do? God uses Paul to help heal some of those that are sick. Paul begins to spread the gospel. And eventually, uh, three months later, they're able to leave and make their way to Rome. And and, and Paul is able to continue on in preaching the gospel. Paul went through many various trials, and it was God's will for his life, and God had a purpose for it. But it also goes on to say that, that if necessary, you have been grieved by the various trials. And and church, I I made this statement last week that, you know, in the beginning of verse 6, he says that we are to greatly rejoice. But to greatly rejoice doesn't mean that we're not going to grieve. It doesn't mean that we ignore the fact that we're facing trials in our life. This word grieve simply means to experience grief great grief. It's a word that, that, that you know, was used when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26. And you remember when he prayed for a little bit, and then he gets up, and he goes, and he finds Peter and James and John sleeping. And he tells them, can you not stay awake? Can you not pray? But it makes this statement. It says that Jesus became troubled and sorrowful. It's the same word that is used here in 1 Peter. He grieved greatly. It's the same word that is used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when it talks about how we as believers, uh, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve, but we grieve differently. But the idea is this, this, this idea to greatly grieve means that when we face trials, we're not ignoring the fact that it hurts. 
We're not sitting there ignoring and saying, oh, yeah, I'm glad I lost my job. Praise God. No, what it says and what it means is that, yes, it hurts. Financially, yes, I'm struggling. Yes, I'm going through a marriage trial. Yes, financial, or, or I've lost my job. Yes, you know, uh, this COVID-19 has got me all stirred up. Yes, I, I, I'm struggling. It doesn't mean that you, you don't admit that. You do struggle, and it's okay to admit that. But what it means here, to greatly rejoice even though we grieve, means that the reason we can rejoice even while we grieve is because we know God is good and that his love is unfailing. But also, the reason we can rejoice greatly even while we grieve is because verse 6 goes on to say that these trials are just for a little while. It's temporary, church. And I made a statement last week. That even if we have to suffer here upon this life for 80 plus years, for us as believers, that's a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. We can rejoice because we know what awaits us as born again believers. Now we spend a lot of time on verse 6, but in order for us to to understand the rest of this idea of being tested by, by fire, we needed to get this understanding that as born again believers, we will face various trials. And so when we do, We must not miss the lesson that God is wanting to teach us. So what are the lessons that God is wanting to teach us? Well, here's point number two. And we find this in verse seven, and it is this. What it is that God wants us to understand and the reason why we suffer and why we face trials is because trials will reveal the genuineness of your faith. In other words, church, what that means is that as born-again believers, our faith at times needs to be purified and it needs to be shown to be genuine. Notice what he says in verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's this reminder that our faith will be tested. And it has been said that if a, a, a faith A faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And and what Paul wants us to understand is that our faith will be tested. And the reason it is tested is to reveal the genuineness of our faith. You know, there are, 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 I've been in, again, in the ministry long enough that I've had, uh, been around people who profess to be Christians, but they have a false faith. And the way that their faith is revealed to be false is that when they find themselves in a trial, church, they walk away from the faith. And it's not that they've lost their salvation. Simply put, they never had the faith to begin with. Vance Havner put it this way. The faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. Now, that's a mouthful. Let me say it again. The faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. In other words, they never had it to begin with. Man, it's this idea, uh, it's the same concept that Jesus used in the parable in Matthew, Luke, and and, and Mark, in the parable of the sower and the seed. When he talks about this idea that as the seed went out, some fell on the hard path, and the birds came in and snatched it away. And, of course, that was symbolic of Satan coming in and taking that word away, and that individual never had that opportunity to uh, receive that seed. But then it talks about this fact that some of that seed falls on rocky soil, some of it falls among the weeds, but the ones that, that, that fall on the rocky soil, they never really take root. They spring up, but they don't have a deep root system. And when the sun comes out, it burns it up. And, of course, the sun is symbolic of, of trials and tribulations and struggles that we go through, that people go through. And let me just say this. I know he's dealing with Christians here, but, but can I tell you, everybody in this world has to deal with trials and struggles and tribulation because we live in a world that is marred by sin. And, and, and so it's just a reality for all of us. But for those who claim to have faith in Christ, but then when they face these trials, these tribulations, these struggles, when the sun is bearing down on them, if they walk away from their faith, church, they never had it to begin with. A lot of people take that parable of Jesus out of context. Say it's in reference to those who maybe have lost their salvation. We don't lose our salvation, church. We never had it to begin with. Some refer to it as, well, they have fallen away. No, here's what we need to understand about the parables of the soil, is that there was one. When the seed fell on it, it took root, root. And when it took root, it grew and it produced fruit. It produced the genuineness of the faith that they'd placed in Jesus Christ. And so our faith has to be tested. It has to be purified, shown to be genuine. And Paul lays it out here by using the example of a goldsmith. Notice what he says. 
more precious than gold that per- perishes, though it is tested by fire. Listen, you know, in today's economy, gold is a very uh, uh, valuable uh, uh, commodity. But yet Peter tells us that as born-again believers, we have something that's far more valuable than gold, and it is our faith. And here's what he says. He says that faith that we have has to be tested by fire. And so he uses the example in the sense of a goldsmith here. You know, goldsmith, when they go out and they would collect what is known as ore gold, O-R-E, uh, gold, uh, what that meant is that it wasn't solid gold. And, of course, if you know anything about gold, we know that solid gold or 100% gold or pure gold is what we refer to as 24-karat gold. And that means that there is no impurities in that very thing that is a 24-karat piece of gold. Uh, this, this wedding ring I have on right here, it's 14-karat. So what that means is that 58% of it is gold. So there's 42% of impurities. I hope I did the math right now. But there's 42% of impurities in this ring still to this day. And what people want more than anything when they have gold, because it's more valuable than anything, is a 24-karat piece, 24 piece of gold because it is pure. But how do you get to that 24-karat piece of gold? It goes through a process, church. When they find the ore gold, here's what the goldsmith does. And I love this concept. You, if you go and you look this up, and there was these, these phrases that were used to explain how you, uh, they go about uh, making sure that they get pure gold and making gold pure, and as it, it's purified. And, and here's what they do. Here's the words that were used. Uh, they use words such as crush. First, they take that ore gold and they crush it. Then they use the word pulverize it. So they crush it, they pulverize it, then they stick it in what is known as a smelting furnace, furnace and that furnace is heated to, get this, 1,947.2 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what it has to be heated to in order for the impurities to begin to fall to the bottom so that the gold begins to rise to the top and what you begin to have is pure gold. And then they were able to take that and create something beautiful out of it. Church, listen to me. As Christians, we must understand that sometimes the very trials we go through, as Christians, we're going to feel like we're being crushed. We're going to feel like we're being pulverized. Sometimes we're going to feel like we're in the the, the furnace of affliction. But we must understand that as we go through that, we're being tested by fire. And our faith is being shown or being purified and being shown to be genuine. And we may sit there and say, well, you know, how long do I have to stay in this fiery furnace? Because some of you right now, you're finding yourself in that fiery furnace. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe financially you're struggling. Maybe you have a health struggle, whatever it may be. Some of you have found yourself in the fiery furnace of affliction, and you're sitting there saying, how long is God going to allow me to, to, to find myself in this fiery furnace? Let me tell you this. As I, I was reading on this, it is said that the goldsmith, you want to know how he, a lot of times they say, determines that it's pure? When the gold has finally become pure, it's, they said it's when he's able to see his reflection in the gold. And as you look at that from a spiritual sense, church, a lot of times we must understand that we will find ourselves in the fiery furnace of affliction. And we will remain in that uh, furnace, in a sense, until God begins to see the reflection of the very character of Jesus Christ in you and me. And church, I want us to understand that when he begins to see that, that's a lot of times when we will find ourselves being delivered from the furnace of affliction. But we come out with our faith stronger. We come out knowing that our faith is genuine because we persevered. Now, let me just say this. Um, And actually, I'll read this. This comes from the the Bible expository uh, commentary, but it it ties in the end of verse 7 with this idea that, uh, you know, when we uh, have faith in the midst of suffering here in this life, we bring glory and honor and praise to God. But the full glory of God or the full glory and honor and praise that that, uh, is deserved of Jesus, that Jesus deserved, is not completely or fully revealed until that day he returns. And so let me just read this to you. It says this, the important point is that this glory that is spoken of at the end of verse 7 is not fully revealed until Jesus returns for his church. So our trying experiences today are preparing us for glory tomorrow. When we see Jesus Christ, we will bring praise and honor and glory to him if we have been faithful in the sufferings of this life. And this very well explains why Peter associated rejoicing with suffering. In other words, a lot of times we may not be able to rejoice 
based upon the affliction that we find ourselves in or the trial that we find ourselves in. We don't rejoice over what it is we're going through, but rather we rejoice based upon what awaits us on that day when we finally get to see Jesus Christ, on that day when Jesus Christ is fully revealed. It speaks of this time of his second coming, the time that he returns. And that's what awaits us in that, knowing that we get to go home and to be with him. So maybe that brings us to this question of, you know, why is it or how is it do I know my faith has become genuine? Here it is, church. Peter goes on and and he says, one of the ways we can know our our faith is genuine is that we begin to look to Jesus in the midst of our trials. So point number three is this. Trials should lead you to look to Jesus. Look at the first part of verse 8. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do, now see, do not now see him, you believe in him. Church, one of the greatest things you and I can do when we find ourselves in the midst of a trial, the greatest thing we can do to endure that trial is to fix our eyes on Jesus. The author of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And understand what Peter is saying here. What he's saying is, as believers, we don't, we don't get to see Jesus with the physical eyes, but rather what we do is we see Jesus with the eyes of faith. Notice he says, you don't see him, but you love him. You don't see him now, but but you believe him. How can we love him? How can we believe him? Why do we love him? Why do we believe him? It goes all the way back up to the very beginning. The reason we love Jesus Christ, the reason we believe in Jesus Christ, is because of what Jesus Christ has done for you and me. Remember, God the Father chose you. This is what verses 1 and 2 speak of in chapter 1. God the Father chose you. God the Son cleansed you. God the Holy Spirit changes you. Because of that and because of what he's done in your life, because of how he's changed your life, this fact that he has forgiven you of your sins and given you eternal life, because of this, you love him and you believe him. And what Peter wants us to understand is that if we truly love him and believe him based upon what it is that he's done for us, man, the greatest thing you and I can do in the midst of a trial, in the midst of a pandemic, is to fix our eyes on Jesus. And there's an awesome story in the Old Testament of fixing your eyes on a God that you cannot see. We know he's there, we know he's real, but, but you can't see him physically. It comes from Second Chronicles chapter 20. Go back and read it sometime. But Jehoshaphat, he's the king of Judah. And at this time, uh, Jehoshaphat and the Jews, uh, they are surrounded by the uh, Amorites and the Moabites. And the Amorites and the Moabites are getting ready to attack. And Jehoshaphat and the Jews understand that there's nothing they can do. They're, they can't stand. There's no way they're going to be able to stand and fight back against these, this enemy. And what they begin to do is they begin to, to be concerned. And Jehoshaphat prays a prayer, and he prays his prayer in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. He says this, O oh God. We have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now, in the midst of this, there's one of these Israelites that speak up. His name is Jehaziel. Jehaziel comes before Jehoshaphat and the Jews, and he says, Listen, one thing you need to remember is that you're not fighting this battle, but this is God's battle to fight. And as Jehaziel reminds them of this, Jehoshaphat, and the Jews get on their knees and they begin to pray and cry out to God. And God gives Jehoshaphat a, a, a battle plan. And it's a battle plan that didn't make sense, but it was God's plan. Here's what the battle plan consisted of, church. God told Jehoshaphat to take the singers, those who led the Jews, the Israelites, in singing. We can refer to them as the choir. And to put them out on the front line. And their sole job was to begin to sing. You know what they sang, church? Uh, they, they sit there and sing, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. That was the battle plan. But yet in the midst of this, here's what happened, church. As the choir began to sing, as the singers began to praise, God came upon the enemy and he ambushed them and they turned upon themselves. And God did everything that was necessary. Now what's the lesson? The lesson is this, is that the Israelites, they quit focusing on their enemy And they begin to focus on God. And when you focus on God, you begin to praise God. Church, listen to me. When we face a trial, we have to quit looking at the trial that is going on around us and begin to fix our eyes on Jesus. Because when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we're going to begin to praise him. And we're going to have victory over the very trial we're facing because we're praising the one who is eternal. Remember, the trials are just for a little while. And if anybody knows anything about keeping your eyes on Jesus in the midst of a storm, it's Peter. 
Remember in, in, in Matthew chapter 14, the disciples are in the boat. The storm is raging. Jesus comes walking on the water. Peter says, Jesus, if that is you, tell me to come to you. Peter steps out of the boat. He begins to walk to Jesus. And everything is good, church, until what? Until he took his eyes off of Jesus. He began to look at the, the, the waves. He began to notice the lightning, the, 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 the wind. He began to feel the wind. He began to hear the thunder. When he took his eyes off of Jesus and began to notice the storm, he began to sink. But yet when his eyes was on Jesus, there was great excitement and joy. Church, what a great reminder. The genuineness of your faith. How how do you know if your faith is genuine? One of the ways is this idea of knowing that when you face a trial, you're not going to look at the trials, but you're going to look to Jesus. And you're going to begin to praise him in the midst of the storm. Now here's the final point. So uh, we're going to face various trials. Trials uh, reveal the genuineness of our faith. And these trials then... As they reveal the genuineness of our faith, they lead you and I to look to Jesus. And as we look to Jesus, here's what we're going to be reminded of. We're going to be reminded of what it is that Jesus has done for us. And Peter points this out in the the last part of verse 8 and all of verse 9. And here's point number 4. It says this, trials can yield a joy that is inexpressible. That's inexpressible. That word means unspeakable. It means indescribable. In other words, this joy is too great for words that you and I get to experience. So here's what, what, what Peter's doing. In, in, in the last part of verse 8 and verse 9, he's just, in a sense, summing up what he had started in verse 6, that we are to greatly rejoice. And now he's saying that you can have this joy that is inexpressible. Now, church, as he repeats this truth, I want you to remember something I said last week, that rejoicing is not a, not a feeling, but it's a choice. And that God in his word never sits there and says to you and me that, that we can rejoice if you feel like it. No, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always. And that's not the only place he says it, but that's a good start. Church, we are to rejoice always, even in the midst of suffering. I, I, I again, made the statement uh, in, in the last few weeks that, that this idea that what sets us apart is this idea that we can rejoice even in the midst of suffering. This is what makes us, one of the things that makes us different. Paul or Peter is wanting us to understand that what sets us apart from this world that we live in, what makes us different is this idea that we can rejoice even in the midst of suffering. And we say, well, how can we rejoice? Here it is. This is what Peter tells us. As believers, we can rejoice because we have obtained, as he says there in verse 8, we have obtained what it is that has been promised to us. And what is it that has been promised to us? What has been promised to us as born-again believers is our salvation. So notice what he says there, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So as believers, we can rejoice because we have obtained what has been promised to us, the salvation of our soul, the salvation of our soul, he says, is based upon the outcome of your faith. And here's the beauty of all this. When he he uses this and he says this, he sums up everything he has just said from verse 3 down to verse 9. And what he wants us to understand is that this faith, the salvation that we have obtained, the salvation is, it, it has a past, it has a present, and it has a future. So in other words, salvation is past, it is present, it is future. Another way of saying that, and Peter points this out in these verses, in verses 3 through 9, that we are justified, we are sanctified, and we are glorified eventually. And so salvation is past. Notice he says that in verse 3, that that he has caused us to be born again. So when you enter into a saving relationship in Jesus Christ, when you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave, at that moment you receive a new birth and you are saved. I was saved on February 26, 1995. Salvation, is that is my salvation in the past. But salvation is also a, a present. It has a present. And again, Peter points this out in verse 5. He, he, he says there and he says that, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation. So this fa- salvation that we get to rejoice about, that we have obtained based upon the outcome of our faith, it has caused us to be born again. And right now as a born again believer, your salvation is being guarded by the power of God. That it can't be taken away from you. And part of that is this process of sanctification and you know that, and it's going this, this, you're growing, you're maturing. But also salvation is future as well. And we see this in verse 4, when he uses the word an inheritance. And remember, this inheritance is permanent, and it cannot be tarnished. 
And he speaks about the fact that this inheritance, at the end of verse 5, he says, will be revealed in the last time. So church, the reason we can rejoice, the reason we have a joy that is inexpressible is because of the salvation that we have been given. The salvation, it has a past. It, we were born again. We were given a new birth. It has a present. God's working on you right now, and he's protecting your salvation. But yet the salvation also, there's, a, there's the, the end of that, the inheritance of that that awaits us. And because of that, church, understand that this right here gives us a certain uh, cause, certainly causes us to have an inexpressible and glorious joy for what Jesus Christ has done in our life. Church, listen to me. As Peter lays this out, as born-again believers, he's saying, you're going to face various trials. It's going to happen. You can't deny that fact. But when they do happen, what are the lessons? What is it that God is teaching us? And once you face those trials, we must understand the reason we face the trials is because it is to reveal the genuineness of our faith. Our faith has to be purified and shown to be genuine. And not only that, our trials should lead us to fix our eyes on Jesus. And when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we remember what it is he has done for us. The salvation that we have been given through him. And what it does is this trials, it, it, it leads to a joy that is inexpressible. A joy that is inexpressible. In other words, what Peter wants us to understand, church, is that there's no such thing as a joyless Christian. But this idea of a joyless Christian is a contradiction. There's a story told of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, uh, the great reformer, uh, took a stand on a lot of important things when it came to the scriptures and what the scriptures said. And because of that, he faced a lot of criticism and in the midst of that faced a lot of trials and troubles and struggles. And the stories tell us that at one point in time, it began to have an effect on him to the point that it is said that he began to hold up in his study, in, in, in his house. And he began to become depressed. He began to get down. Uh, he began to somewhat become uh, angry, it, it began to have a bad mood. And it is said that one day his wife Katie came into the study dressed in all black with a black veil over her face. When she walked in, it is said that Martin Luther looked at her and said, Katie, who died? To which she said this. She said, God has died. Now it is said that when she said this, that Martin Luther took offense to that. He set up very quickly. His eyes got big. And these are the words he said. He said, silly woman, God has not died. To which Katie replied back, oh, well, I thought by the way you were acting that God had died. And she turned around and walked out. Now it is said that that very statement got a hold of Martin Luther. Because what Katie was saying is, Martin Luther, no matter how bad it gets, no matter what trials you find yourself in, Jesus is alive, and God is always in control. Martin Luther said he began to re remember that and believe that again, to the point that he began to get rid of his bad mood, he began to come out of his depression, and he began to rejoice again. Church, let me ask you something. Is God dead? No. Is Jesus alive? Absolutely. So because he is, let's begin to show the world that we can rejoice even in the midst of a trial. That we can rejoice even in the midst of suffering. That we can rejoice even in the midst of a pandemic. But understand, the only way we can rejoice is if we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. As we close this morning, I just want to uh, share this with you. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to have a hard time fixing your eyes on Jesus when you find yourself in the midst of a trial. And I want you to know that today, God is, is drawing some of you that are watching to his son Jesus today. And today you realize that God is, is revealing the sin that you have in your life and that that sin has separated you from God and that, that you need salvation, that you need the very grace that God is offering you through his son Jesus Christ today. And you know right now God is calling you to, to surrender your life to him. And the scripture tells us this in Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if we confess our sins, or actually if we uh, confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, you can be saved. For it's with the heart that one believes and is justified, it's with the mouth that one confesses and is saved.
And if you're willing to confess that Jesus is Lord of your life, believe in what it is that he's done for you on the cross, you can have eternal life. You can have a, a, this joy that is inexpressible. And you can rejoice even in the midst of heartache. You can rejoice even in the midst of a trial. If you're making that decision this morning for the first time, I would encourage you to do this. Get a hold of me. Email me, Travis at FBCBlanchard.org. Call the church, 405-485-2181. I even think we're we're trying something new today. I think there's a a Google document that you'll be able to click and and click on, and you can go through and and you can fill it out, and it'll get to us, and we'll, we'll receive it, and we'll be able to get a hold of you. And listen, it's not just for those who uh, uh, um, uh, that need to be saved. It's for anybody that, that maybe God's dealing with something in your life and you need prayer. Will you reach out to us? Maybe, maybe God is, is telling you, you're a born-again believer, but you need to follow in believer's baptism. Will you reach out to us? Listen, even in the midst of a pandemic, we can get, you can get baptized and we'll make it safe. Listen, we just want you to simply be obedient to God. So I'm going to pray. And as soon as I pray and say amen, Man, we would encourage you to one of those ways to get a hold of us. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for this fact and helping us understand that as believers, we are going to face various trials. Yet even though we face those trials, we know that the reason we face them is to test the genuineness of our faith. And so, Lord, right now, for those of us that may be going through trials, I pray, Lord, that we will, you'll begin to give us the strength to look to your son Jesus in the midst of this trial reminding ourselves what it is that Jesus has done in our life and that no matter what this world does to us, there's one thing the world cannot take from us, and that is our salvation. That is our eternal life. Lord, if there's those today that are listening to this, that maybe you're drawing to your son Jesus, I pray today will be the day that they will surrender their life to you and make you Lord, boss, master of their life. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that it encourages us even in the midst of trials. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, I want you to know that as soon as this is over, questions will pop up. But just know before I leave, and I say this every Sunday, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I love you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon.